Will your death receive an end appropriate to the life that you've lived? Is there a storyline to be found in the events of our lives? Can you be a good Christian and a good citizen? Are the loyalties we owe to both church and state so contradictory that we cannot fulfill both? What are the characteristics that cause a people to love their country? Which laws will help a country stand strong and which will tear it down? If you find these questions interesting, I invite you to come with me as we look at Sophocles' Theban Trilogy. In these three short plays, Sophocles gives us a lovely opportunity to reflect on these questions and to draw wisdom from doing so. Later on in GBT1, we'll be reading Aeschylus's Oresteia, and that is also a trilogy of plays. However, in that trilogy of plays, the storyline predominates, and there's only one major theme that's developed. However, in Sophocles' Theban trilogy, you'll find that we not only have one storyline, but each play develops a major theme. Aristotle exhorts playwrights to make sure that thought is one of the elements that is contained in their plays, and in this regard we can see Sophocles as overachieving. Each play has a dominant theme that is fascinating and engaging, and sometimes the storyline itself gets a little overridden. Before we look in more detail at the story of Oedipus Rex, I should say that a major character in this story, and the entirety of the Theban trilogies, is the Oracle at Delphi. And I have all sorts of things I'd like to show you about the Oracle at Delphi, but that's going to take another video. So I think probably after this one's done, that will be the next one up. So please do look for that video because you do need to know a lot about the Oracle at Delphi to understand why things happen in these stories as they do. Before Oedipus Rex begins, there's a lot of things that happen that actually occur before the actual story that we find in the play. And that's kind of background material that gets revealed in the play itself. But I'll tell you that information beforehand so you understand how we get to the beginning of the play. Oedipus has a very sad childhood. He actually is cursed as a child. A very sad curse upon him that he is going to marry his mother and then also murder his father. Well, when his parents hear this curse, they decide the best thing to do is actually to give him to a servant to throw out on the side of the mountain and hope that this cursed child will die. Children are cute, and shepherds don't like to kill children, and so rather than killing this child, the shepherd actually sent him to another shepherd who took this little child to Corinth. And Corinth, the king and queen, were in need of a child. They had no child, and so they pretended and told everyone that this was in fact their child. They raised Oedipus as their own, and soon enough, he was the prince of Corinth. Unbeknownst to himself, he was actually the son of Laius and Jocasta of Thebes. Oedipus's life gets more interesting as <clears throat> one day he is in a bar and a drunkard shouts out that he is actually not the child of his parents. Being very concerned about this, he goes to the oracle at Delphi and asks, and the oracle says that he is cursed to marry his mother and to kill his own father. Well, Oedipus, being a good son, doesn't want this to happen, and so he immediately runs from the city of Corinth, and as he's running from Corinth, he meets a man on the road who he gets into a fight with, and he kills. As you can guess, that man was his father. Unknown to him, though, Oedipus goes on to the city of Thebes. Well, when he gets to Thebes, he finds that Thebes is under a strange occupation. The Sphinx has actually set itself up outside Thebes and will not allow anyone to come in or out of the city unless they answer her riddle. Oedipus does actually figure out what her riddle is. The Sphinx leaves and he becomes the beloved king of Thebes. And as is common, when you become the king of a city, you marry the previous king's queen. This is Jocasta, who happens to be his mother. This is all unknown to him, and so he lives an apparently happy life, has four children, and yet one day Thebes comes under a plague. 
And wondering what to do, they again send to the oracle at Delphi, and the oracle at Delphi tells them that there is a very cursed individual in their city that must be taken out. Oedipus begins a search for who this cursed individual might be. However, it comes to light that he is actually the murderer of the previous king. In examining the circumstances of the previous king's death, they find that it happened right at the place where Oedipus killed that man that he met on the road. Well, Oedipus, fearing the worst, begins to also examine whether or not he might be that child that was thrown out on the side of the mountain. He begins to ask further questions, and as his questioning progresses, it begins to dawn on him that he is actually the son of his own wife. Well, as Jocasta sees this information unraveling, she finds that it is too much for her to face, and she will actually commit suicide. Oedipus, though, a more determined fellow, decides to find out exactly whether or not this is is true, that he would be this cursed child. And it is finally revealed when he brings in the very shepherd that had left him on that mountainside that he, in fact, is this cursed child. The major themes developed in Oedipus the King are the inevitability of fate and the downfall of the proud. Oedipus has a very grim fate that is put upon his life, and that fate is chasing him in such a way that he simply cannot get away from it. If you remember, Achilles chasing Hector around Troy, and though Hector runs and runs and runs, he can never escape Achilles. Something very similar is happening to Oedipus. He has a very terrible fate coming after him, and he can't get away from it. The usual pagan response to this particular situation is to be strong, knowing that fate is coming after you. You face it like a man, and if you can't get away from it, you might as well die fighting it. That's the way Hector dies. He dies facing Achilles, swooping down upon him, and yet he comes to his end. Oedipus also has a fate that he must face, and it will come after him, and finally it will surely bring him down. Also, fate is generally associated with how you will die. What is your fated day of death? How will your death come about? However, there is also for the pagans a general sense that our ends and how our lives go is oftentimes appropriate to the character that we show. If we are particularly evil, we will have a particularly evil end. If you are good and righteous, then you will usually have a righteous and blessed end to your life. The pagans also spoke of fate in the sense that things that come to us in our lives should be understood as having come from the hand of the gods. The best example of this is Eumaeus. Eumaeus, the pious swine herd who spoke with Odysseus in his hut, had all sorts of pious phrases that he would give. He said, all wanderers and beggars come from Zeus. And also said, Zeus grants us this or that, or else refrains from granting as he wills. All things are in his power. The pagans oftentimes had a sense that the things that come to us in our lives are meant to be there. They have a meaning and a significance, and if we will look carefully at them, perhaps we can perceive what that significance is. When Oedipus falls, it is not simply a fortuitous fate that is given against him. When Oedipus falls, it's because he has lifted himself up. At the beginning of the play, Oedipus lifts himself even up into the place of God. He tells the people they no longer need to pray because he is there to solve their problems. Oedipus confuses himself with a sort of godlike figure, even calling the altar his own. And because of that, he is brought to a very low end. He lifts himself high and is brought very low. So his fate is also appropriate to his particular character and the actions that he's shown. Later in the play, the chorus in seeing the life of Oedipus reflects that, in fact, fate does guide our lives. And because fate guides our lives, we should know our place. 
we should not try to lift ourselves too high and also we should be particularly wary of those who do not acknowledge the role of God in our lives and the directing hand of the gods in shaping the things that we encounter in life. At line 955, the chorus reflects and says, Destiny, guide me always. Destiny, find me filled with reverence, pure in word and deed. Great laws tower above us, reared on high, born for the brilliant vault of heaven. Olympian sky, their only father, nothing mortal, no man gave them birth. Their memory, deathless, never lost in sleep. Within them lives a mighty God, the God does not grow old. Well, reflecting that we should give heed to the guidance of the gods in our lives, the chorus goes on and speaks against those who as tyrants would lift themselves up against the laws of God. Oedipus and his wife Jocasta often mocked the warnings that were given that they needed to heed the words of the gods, and they said the gods did not need to be given much credit. However, this is just the sort of person that should not be a ruler. A ruler should be the one who heeds the words of the gods and is quick to look to the direction that the gods would give. So the chorus goes on. Pride breeds the tyrant. Violent pride, gorging, crammed to bursting with all that is overripe and rich with ruin. Clawing up to the heights, headlong pride crashes down the abyss, sheer doom. And in an affirmation of more democratic form of government, where people come together trying to understand in common what the principles of justice are, the chorus says, No footing helps, all foothold lost and gone, but the healthy strife that makes the city strong, I pray that God will never end that wrestling. God, my champion, I will never let you go. When we come to Oedipus at Colonus, we find Oedipus having been rejected by his city and in exile looking for refuge. He comes to a small city by the name of Colonus. This is a suburb of Athens and there is a grove in the city of Colonus that is for the kindly spirits, the Eumenides. The citizens of Athens are very concerned about Oedipus coming into their sacred grove given his unseemly history. However, Theseus, the founder of Athens, comes and richly receives Oedipus with all the hospitality that Athens is so well known for. Even though Oedipus could very easily be shunned as someone who no one would want to have in their city, the generous Athenians receive him and Theseus is glad to give him sanctuary. In return for all of this hospitality, Oedipus desires to give Athens a blessing. That blessing is the burial place of his own body, which will give special protection to the city where he's buried in time of war. Even though he desires to be buried in Athens, the long hand of Theban politics tries to reassert itself. Creon, Oedipus's brother-in-law and uncle, comes and tries to get him to come back to Thebes so that Thebes can have the protection of his burial place. And even Oedipus's son Polynices also tries to involve him and desires him to return to Thebes as well. Both Polynices and Creon show their true colors when they attempt to not only insult Oedipus in order to intimidate him to come back and return with them, but also try to kidnap his daughters Antigone and Ismene. Theseus rides in to put down this sort of nonsense and to establish justice and the true hospitable Athenian way and in return Oedipus is quite glad to be led off by Theseus to his secret burial place and in a glorious moment of transfiguration he is buried near Athens in an undisclosed burial site, forever being a protector to them. The themes developed in Oedipus at Colonus are familiar. They are the love of country and patriotism. The play is supposed to be about Thebes. However, as you read this play, you quickly realize it's not so much about Thebes as it is about Athens. 
This play is a very patriotic Athenian tale. And as most stock patriotic tales go, you find that all of the Athenians are very good, and all of the Thebans, who are the ancient enemies of Athens, are very bad. You have to understand that Thebes is actually the ancient enemy of Athens. During the Persian War, the Thebans actually sided with the Persians and helped the Persians attack the Athenians. Well, and so in this play, you find all the men from Thebes are very evil. Creon, Apollonices, when they arrive, they do nothing but plot evil schemes. And the Athenians, on the other hand, such as the noble Theseus, who is a sort of George Washington figure for the Athenians, does everything right and virtuous. Also, the reputation of Athens is spoken often of in this play. The Athenians are looked to as people who are high-minded, kind to strangers, and willing to help the weak. There are many examples throughout the text of the high and lofty character of the Athenians, and as they're praised, it brings to mind the funeral oration of Pericles that we'll read in Great Books 2 next year. Pericles, the great Athenian general, gave a funeral oration that lists all the great attributes of the Athenians and praises them very highly. Well, some of the same characteristics are mentioned in this play. On page 299 at line 274, Oedipus, speaking to his daughter Antigone, says, Then what's the good of glory, magnificent renowned, if in its flowing it streams away to nothing? If Athens, Athens is that rock of reverence, all men say it is, the only city on earth to save the ruined stranger, the only one to protect him, give him shelter, where are such kindnesses for me? Oedipus knows that when he comes to Athens, he can plead with the Athenians to live up to their reputation as a people who is known for reaching out to the outcast, the downtrodden, and being a beacon of hope for humanity. In line 635, Theseus is speaking to Oedipus, and he speaks in the most generous of terms to this stranger who most would want nothing to do with. Never, I tell you, will I never shrink from a stranger, lost as you are now, or fail to lend a hand and save a life. I'm only a man, well I know, and I have no more power over tomorrow, Oedipus, than you. And Oedipus replies, O oh, Theseus, so magnanimous and so noble. Well, heavy praise for Athens, but with the, re with the reputation that they have, it doesn't shoot far from the mark. In line 760, the chorus develops a sort of Athenian version of America the Beautiful, listing off the wonderful characteristics that they love their city for. Well, as I read this chorus, think of your own reasons for loving your own country and see how patriotism and love of country is indeed an old virtue. Here, stranger, here in the land where horses are a glory, you have reached the noblest home on earth. Colonists glistening, brilliant in the sun, where the nightingale sings on, her dying music rising clear, hovering always, never leaving, down the shadows, deepening green, she haunts the glades, the wine-dark ivy, dense and dark, the untrodden, sacred wood of God, rich with laurel and olives, never touched by the sun, untouched by storms that blast from every quarter, where the reveler, Dionysus, strides the earth forever, where the wild nymphs are racing round him, nymphs who nursed his life. And here it blooms, fed by the dews of heaven, lovely clustering morning fresh forever, Narcissus, crown of the great goddesses, mother and daughter dying into life from the dawn of time, and the gold crocus breaks like break of day, and the springs will never sleep, will never fail, the fountainhead of Sisyphus, flowing nomad, quickening life forever, fresh each day, life rising up with the river's pure tide, flowing over the plains, the swelling breast of earth, nor can the dancing muses bear to leave this land, or the goddess Aphrodite, the charioteer with the golden reins of love. And there is a marvel here, I have not heard its equal, nothing famed in the vast expanse of Asia, nothing like it in Pelops' broad Dorian island ever sprang to light, a creation, self-creating, never conquered, 
a terror to our enemies and their spears. It flourishes to greatness in our soil. A gray-leafed olive, mother, nurse of children, perennial generations growing in her arms, neither young nor old can tear her from her roots, the eternal eyes of guardian Zeus. Look down upon her always, great Athena too, her eyes gray-green and gleaming at the sea. And I have another praise to sing in song, a mighty gift bestowed our mother city, the splendor of a majestic ancient god, the pride and power of all the earth, the glory of horses, glory of young horses, the glorious rippling sinews of the sea. O oh, Poseidon, you have throned her in this power, Lord God of the sea lanes, you were first to forge the bitten bridle, first to curb the fiery rage of stallions in these roads, and your ship flies like a marvel past the land, your long flashing oars whipping the sea, mounting the white manes of the sea, racing the sea nymphs, dancing past the prow. Athens was known for being a generous and open-hearted city. Given natural beauty and the skill of their artisans, Athenians were very proud of who their city was. They were proud of themselves and they were proud to defend the city they loved. The third and final play in the Theban trilogy is Antigone. Antigone opens after the disastrous civil war between Oedipus' sons Eteocles and Polynices has left both of them dead. The younger brother Eteocles supplanted his older brother Polynices as king of Thebes, and Polynices decided to show his own brand of patriotism by gathering together seven surrounding cities and bringing them in a united army to destroy Thebes. After Eteocles and Polynices destroy one another in the battle for the throne of Thebes, Uncle Creon has to take the throne and reestablish order. In order to deter any further would-be rebels, Creon makes a decree that denies any proper burial rites to the elder brother Polynices. In Christian terms, you might think of this as simply a government edict declaring that someone would go to hell. Oedipus's two daughters, Ismene and Antigone, respond to the situation very differently. Ismene thinks that they ought to humbly comply with their uncle's edict. However, Antigone sees the situation as an excellent opportunity for herself to gain great glory in bearing her brother in contradiction to her uncle's decree. Without consulting her uncle or pleading for a reversal, she simply goes and buries his body herself. In the confrontation between Antigone and Creon, Antigone argues that she is just doing what any sibling would do for her brother and what the gods see as right. Yet from the way that she treats her loving sister Ismene, it is difficult to believe that she spends much time at all concerned about the needs of her family. Despite her claims to divine authority and guidance, her own obsession with glory makes it fairly obvious that she rarely consults or cares about the concerns of the gods. Creon, on the other hand, claims to be working for the good of national security as well as the law and order of Thebes. However, his attitude towards Antigone is so egotistical it becomes clear his only true concern is for his own security. When the prophet Tiresias comes to Creon and confronts him with his presumption, Tiresias is able to persuade Creon to reverse his order. However, by the time Creon comes to attempting to save Antigone from the judgment that he set against her, she has already confirmed her own rash character by taking her own life. With Antigone having taken her own life, the road to redemption for Creon is sadly closed. Not only does Creon fail to save Antigone, but his own son Haman, who happens to be engaged to Antigone, is so angry with his own father's actions that he not only kills himself, but dies cursing his father. Shortly after the death of Haman, Creon's wife also takes her life with her husband's curses on her lips. After watching the pathetic mess these two hotheads have made of life in Thebes through the bullheaded inability to humbly give consideration to the concerns and needs of others, 
The Wizen Chorus reflects that wisdom is by far the greatest part of joy. The major themes brought up in the play Antigone are the conflicting loyalties between family and government, or what we might think of as church and state. Also in Antigone, we will have addressed the theme as to what makes the foundation of a good state. Both Creon and Antigone are persuasive speakers, and as you listen to them, it is not difficult to be persuaded that their concerns are in fact legitimate and worthy of our interest. Antigone is very concerned about following the laws of the gods and doing right by her family. On the other hand, Creon is interested in the very understandable concerns of the security of the state. As you listen to them, both are very persuasive, and yet, how can both of these sets of loyalties be kept in fellowship with one another? Is it easy to keep both of them at the same time? In Creon's opening speech, he explains the necessity of establishing order in the state. And given that a civil war has just finished and it's been disastrous for this city, his concerns are understandable. My countrymen, the ship of state is safe. The gods who rocked her after a long, merciless pounding in the storm have righted her once more. As I see it, whoever assumes the task, the awesome task of setting the city's course and refuses to adopt the soundest policies, but fearing someone keeps his lips locked tight, he's utterly worthless. So I rate him now, I always have. And whoever places a friend above the good of his own country, he is nothing. I could never stand by silent watching destruction march against our city, putting safety to rout, nor could I ever make that man a friend of mine who menaces our country. Remember this, our country is our safety. Only while she voyages true on course can we establish friendships, truer than blood itself. Such are my standards, they make our city great. He is concerned about the security of his city, and he's willing to take drastic measures to attempt to ensure it. In her opening words, Antigone can also speak very persuasively on the necessity of doing what is right by our family members, and showing them our first concern. Antigone explains to her sister Ismene, I won't insist, no, even if you should have a change of heart, I'd never welcome you in the labor, not with me. So do as you like, whatever suits you best. I will bury him myself. Antigone explains to her sister Ismene, who's very concerned about her getting hurt by her actions. And even if I die in the act, that death will be a glory. I will lie with the one I love and loved by him, an outrage sacred to the gods. I have longer to please the dead than please the living here. In the kingdom down below, I'll lie forever. Do as you like, dishonor the laws the gods hold in honor. Antigone is very concerned that her actions would be in accordance with the desires of the gods and also the honor of her brother. The chorus, seeing the conflict between Antigone and Creon, reflects that in order to have a good state, the laws of the gods and the laws of men must be made one. When they conflict with one another, it causes conflict and the state becomes weakened. The chorus actually gives a very lovely section where they talk about the greatness of man. It's actually very similar to Psalm 8. Without the overarching praise of God the Creator, this chorus lifts up the various attributes of man that set him apart from the animals and make him a splendid creation. However, tucked into the midst of this speech is a very important statement about the necessity of working together the laws of the gods and the laws of men. Man the master in genius past all measure, past all dreams, the skills within his grasp, he forges on, now to destruction, now again to greatness, when he weaves in the laws of the land and the justice of the gods, that binds his oaths together, he and his city rise high. But the city casts out that man who weds himself to inhumanity, thanks to reckless daring. Never share my hearth, never think my thoughts, whoever does such things. When a man lifts himself up above the right principles of the gods, he's going to bring his city down. It takes the direct intervention of Tiresias the prophet to correct Creon in his error. 
Tiresias comes and rebukes him. He says, You have thrust to the world below a child sprung for the world above, ruthlessly lodged a living soul within the grave. Then you've robbed the gods below the earth, keeping a dead body here in the bright air, unburied, unsung, unhallowed by the rites. You, you have no business with the dead, nor do the gods above. Creon has to see that he has set his own law against the wisdom of the gods. And though he attempts to rectify the situation, this act is so evil that he is not even allowed the opportunity of redemption, and his son and his wife will die cursing him. The harshest judgment on Creon comes when the chorus reflects upon him and says, Creon shows the world that of all ills afflicting men, the worst is lack of judgment. There are many things that can afflict us. However, if we do not have the capacity to humbly understand what is important and to be able to rightly order our principles, we will bring destruction not only on ourselves, but those we love around us. The chorus reflecting upon the disaster that has come from the pride of Creon and Antigone rightly reflects that of all things in life, that bring us joy, wisdom is the foremost. Our foolishness will always destroy life rather than redeeming it. Wisdom is by far the greatest part of joy, and reverence towards the gods must be safeguarded. The mighty words of the proud are paid in full with mighty blows of fate, and at long last those blows will teach us wisdom. One of the great reasons that the Theban Trilogy is such a delightful series of plays is not only that it tells a good story, it also packs in thought and reflection that gives good guidance to life, showing us the importance of wisdom, rightly ordering our lives, and being able to reflect in such a way that we will live our lives well, to choose in a prudent fashion so that in the end we can show that thoughtful character that was so admired by the Greeks. At times, Sophocles seems to be a little over-eager to place all of these great themes in front of us in one short trilogy. However, he should be admired for the attempt to pack in as much wisdom as he can into this small story, giving us guidance beyond just the events that we see portrayed, but being able to draw wisdom by looking at the events of life, reflecting on them, and learning from them.